welcome to the audiobook reading of The God in the Clear Rock, book one in the Skyfire series, written and read by me. So, let's just get started. There's the timer. Chapter one, time remaining until next event, 2,929 years. There we go, bring that in. Location, Olmec Gulf, Lo Gulf Lowlands, Central America. Year, current era, 917 BCE. The light of the full moon coming over the horizon glinted off the point of the long holy blade as it swung high into the air and down into the sleeping man's chest. Again and again, the blade swung up and down. Blood spattered everywhere covering the royal bed and the attacker with misty red spots. When he stopped, the only noise was his heavy breathing and the soft but steady sound of dripping as a dark red pool began to run onto the floor from the bloody and still body. Then the assailant turned and ran out of the royal chamber. When he got outside the king's abode, Six young men were waiting for him. As he quickly walked up to them, they saw the blood covering their older brother. He stopped beside the group of siblings, and the bright moonlight reflected off the deep red stains covering his murderous blade. The closest brother to him spoke in a whisper. Is he? It is done. We cannot stop now. You know what we must do. Did you bring the supplies? The oldest set of twin brothers looked at him with eyes that were perfectly synchronized, and they answered in unison, Yes, we have them. The twin on the right held up several coils of rope with curved metal ends like grappling hooks. I have the ropes. His oldest brother looked at him hard. Are they long enough? The ropes must reach the top or we cannot pull it over. The twin nodded. I have measured them myself. Then his identical twin brother held out his arm. And I have the blankets. Good. Remember, once it is free from the cage, you must not touch it with your bare hands. Cover it with the blankets before you get too close. Both of the twins nodded. The oldest brother allowed himself a small smile. Then he turned to the other four young men. His youngest brothers were also two sets of twins. According to their father, all twins were created by their god. Their god must have favored their father a lot because he only sired twins, four pairs to be exact. Unlike the oldest set of his young twin brothers, who were 22, the youngest four were still teenagers at 19 and 16. All the sets of twins were only three years apart, which, according to their father, was also ordained by their god. The oldest bro brother was 25, but his twin had died in birth. This made him the natural leader of his siblings, but left him with a hole in his life that he could not fill until tonight. When he looked at the four youngest members of his personal raiding party, they all held out their arms. Each of them was holding a long-handled spade-like shovel used for digging in one hand. In their other hand, they each held a tall wooden pole with a long, thick metal rod on one end. After the inspection, the oldest brother turned and headed across the plaza, then out away from the royal city. All three sets of twins followed like a cloned entourage. They moved across the valley in silence and then crossed into the section of rocks that led up to the forbidden temple in the mountains. Except during ceremonies, no one but the king was allowed up here. Each of them knew the punishment for trespassing here without the king's permission and escort. But they also knew there would be no punishment tonight, only success or death. A few minutes later, they were approaching the steeple-shaped cage in the large, open, rocky field near the steep drop-off edge of the mountaintop. Only the oldest brother had ever been here and seen it in person. The other six were awestruck 
stopping and staring with wide eyes. It was beyond anything they had imagined about the fabled home of the God of their people. The cage was made of iron strips that had been crossed over and under each other in a weaving pattern to create a tall, pyramid-shaped building of metal. It resembled a gigantic cage built like a thin steeple. Layers of palm oil had been wiped on and then hand buffed into the interior and exterior surface of the cage twice weekly for millennia, polishing the metal to an almost mirrored smoothness. And it was the king himself and his ancestors before him who did this manual labor for his God, but not anymore. The moon was high overhead and the thick bars of iron glistened in the bright lunar light like a wire frame drawing done in luminescent ink. Inside the metal building, a short set of bars on the ground near the back wall held a small metal topped pedestal and they were connected to the wall. As they approached the temple, a light started emanating from on top of the pedestal, glowing like a miniature sun in the middle of the cage and making the entire temple suddenly seem alive. The god of the Olmec knew they were here. Like many lost ancient cultures, the Mesoamericans called the Olmec received that name long after they disappeared from the earth. The Olmec people were the primitive source genome for all of the great civilizations that followed on the North and South American continents and the strip of land between them. Known among the following great dynasties of the central and southern highlands of Mesoamerica as the Old Ones, they came into existence over a thousand years before Alexander the Great and rose to prominence during, during the New Kingdom period of Egyptian pharaonic dynasties. At the pinnacle of Olmec civilization, all of Europe was still equestrian-based small kingdoms. They called themselves by a name that is long lost to the dust of time, but their name for themselves meant masters of the red rock, and masters they were. The red rock they named themselves for was iron ore, and when the rest of the world was banging iron into steel for blades in swords and knives, the Olmec had a different purpose. With only Bronze Age tools, they perfected the process for smelting and hardening iron. Using techniques handed down to them from unknown forefathers, the Olmec people developed the ironworking skills they would use to rise to absolute dominance in the early Mesoamerican world. They were the first to use metal chisels to carve jade which was the holiest of stones to them. These new tools allowed the Olmec artists to become the undisputed champions in the ancient New World art field. No later culture was ever able to equal the Olmec level of jade art. But jade and iron were not the only arts the Olmec mastered. In 1967, Michael Coe found a magnet at San Lorenzo carved in the form of an oblong bar with a groove from the period of 1000 BC. When Coe tested his hypothesis that this was a crude magnetic compass which had been fashioned 1000 years before the Chinese are credited with inventing such a device, he found he was right. And the Olmec used these compasses to build incredible engineering feats. One of the many complex drainage systems in Olmec territory was excavated that measures over 550 feet long with an almost perfect 2% grade from east to west. Subsidiary lines stretched off the main tunnel for almost 100 feet in various places. The entire system was made from 30 tons of basalt rock that was quarried and hauled more than 35 miles to the final location. Stone covers had been fashioned to cover the channel, which ran for over a quarter of a mile in a perfectly straight line. Modern scientists and archaeologists have no clue as to the purpose or function of this elaborate system of fireproof rock flumes, 
but a modern glassmaker would recognize the purpose in an instant if they saw the structure as it was being used in the millennia before the Julian calendar was born. The technique for making perfect plate glass sheets is not a product of the 20th century after all, and the process of mirroring them isn't either. The Olmec people had mastered techniques of manufacturing that would not be seen again for two and three quarters millennia. But the Olmec's greatest achievement was in the art of iron, and it was the foundation of all the other arts and sciences they mastered. It was not only fundamental to their society, it was used daily by everyone from the peasantry to the land-holding royalty. However, the real Olmec use for iron has remained unknown to this day by modern scholars. It has been well established that the ancient race of Central Americans were the first to develop writing and agriculture in this hemisphere. What was not known was how they were related and how the Olmec used their mastery of iron to achieve these high points of social development. The first was agriculture. The Olmec culture sprang into existence from a more ancient group that had inhabited the same area for many millennia. At the very bottom crook of the Gulf of Mexico, protected by the Yucatan Peninsula on one side and the main Central American landmass on the other side, was the enormous river delta of the Coatzacoalas River system, a massive drainage system for the southern end of the mountainous ridge that ran the length of North America and down through Mexico. It consisted of dozens of large tributaries and mangrove swamps connected to isolated lagoons and freshwater floodplains. Easily equal to the Nile River of Egypt, the annual rainfall would sometimes top 100 inches per year. Each season, the dozens of feeder rivers would flood 20 feet into the lowlands, but when the waters receded, they left behind a gift. Unlike agricultural techniques employed in less fertile areas, this land did not have to be cleared. The river would do it for you. Most importantly, the land did not have to lie fallow after a couple of seasons in order to recuperate from farming. Every year, the rains would deliver the soil and fertilizer to ensure a a bountiful crop. The Olmec used their skill at working iron to make shovels for planting and eventually a harvesting blade. Almost identical to the modern machete, this tool was what allowed the tribal leaders who eventually staked ownership of these fertile plains to unify and consolidate the various villages under their rule. Food for all ensured a compliant and satisfied population. In addition to harvesting, the machete design was the only useful tool for holding back the encroaching jungle. The other principal use of iron was for writing. The Olmec priests pounded and flattened iron plates into thin sheets. Then using preformed punches with uniform and fixed symbols, the art of writing in glyphs became widespread. These paper-thin iron sheets were used to teach and pass on the skills the Olmec had accumulated over centuries. And when rubbed with palm oil over generations, they lasted much better than any form of paper or papyrus in the wet and humid jungles. Iron picks, hammers, and chisels were used to increase the production of iron ore from mines the Olmec began working year-round. Complex food distribution systems and ore transportation processes were added to new smelting and purifying centers, which the Olmec began to build across the fertile southern Gulf lowlands. And iron was what the Olmec traded to get their precious jade there were no naturally occurring deposits of jade within the Olmec territories. All of it came from somewhere else, and there was a massive quantity of Olmec jade. For almost a thousand years, this highly structured society existed in the fertile land of the Iron Masters. And finally, the Olmec had one more use for iron that is still unknown today. It was to serve their God, for it was their God to which the Olmec owed all that they knew, the gifts of language, writing, agriculture, and most importantly, the gift of the mastery of the holy red stone, all came from the deity of the Olmec. Every succeeding New World culture owed these gifts to the Olmec people, 
but they owed them to the God that spoke from the burning bright light, the God that resided in the iron cage, which was built to house and honor her by long-lost forefathers, the God to whom they delivered the fine black powder made from the rock that burns, the God who had taught them to build pyramids in the jungle, and the God who taught them to make the mirrors. Modern scientists have no idea what the mirrors were for. Olmec art seemed to suggest that the ultra-polished concave discs of iron were worn as ornamentation around the necks of rulers, but that was not their purpose. The discs were all fashioned in the same location and over the same period of time. Modern archaeologists have determined the surviving examples of these enigmas of the ancient New World were built by the Olmec, but they readily admit they have no idea how it was actually done. Microscopic analysis reveals no signs of abrasives, yet the level of concave exactness and polish approaches perfection. And that's one minute over the clock. You got an extra minute tonight. All right. We will stop there and reset. And I will see you tomorrow. Just the facts, ma'am.